Gates Foundation. Um, but he cares a lot about philanthropy, right? And uh, has decided they're doing this book together. And they're doing it worldwide and looking at looking at philanthropy in a number of different countries um, and major and the styles of philanthropy. They'll tell you about what they had in mind, and um, uh, this uh, struck them as a good opportunity to get everybody in reaction uh, to what they're thinking about doing. And so they're going to lay out to you essentially what something about the architecture of the book uh, and throw the floor open for discussions. So, and I think before we do that, why don't we go around the table and let people introduce themselves so that, that, so that uh, you know, Matthew and Michael can meet everybody at least by name. Uh, starting with Tony, right over here. Tony Brown, the faculty of public policy institute. And the new president of the Robertson, the Robertson Fellows Foundation, right? Very good. Yeah. Uh, Chris Winter, I had the pleasure of meeting you last evening. Right. I'm Krista Goss, I'm on the faculty here and I'm a former philanthropy reporter. For the Chronicle of Philanthropy. Barry Varela, I'm the uh, case writer for the Duke Foundation Research Program. Matt Weirberg, I'm a former law student and current judicial clerk. Stephen Schumer, an earlier student here at the Law and Public Policy School, so I'm an assistant to Professor Fletcher. Melanie Glassman, I coordinate the Duke Foundation Research Program. Joel Huber, I'm a professor in the Business School. Paul Storms, I'm a joint JD and VP student at the St. Louis School of Law School. is done, I'm a uh, long since retired from all the Carnegie Enterprises. <laughs> Alden, Alden, Alden was the was the program officer for higher education, I think, or education. Everything. At All the education. Carnegie Corporation. <laughs> Alden's education. Uh, Ginger Saul, I'm on the board of Wild Wild Sons and Care and the Family Foundation. I'm Beth Richardson, and I'm currently at Kenan Seidler, um, although I went to Duke as undergrad, so you can let me in. And I'm the co-founder of an organization called Zebra Crossing. I'm Beth Anderson. I'm a lecturer at the Business School and work with Greg Dees, who sends his regards to the Ruby Theater. I'm Mary Mountcastle. I'm a trustee with the North Carolina Base Foundation. So we go back up to Charlie. Uh, Charles Potfelter. I'm on the faculty here at the Public Policy. David Snyder. I'm an undergraduate student and a student of Professor Fleischman's. Well, I'm Bob Kozel. My American name is Jonathan. And I, I came from South Korea, so I'm a university. My name is David Thompson. I'm a joint degree uh, international comparative law student at the law school my third year, and a student at Professor Fleischman. We're delighted to have you here. The floor is now yours, and you can go on for some reason. We are all reason. What? <laughs> 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 Professor Fleischman. What? Aren't we? We're We've all been your students. have been learning from you for years. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, well, thank, well, thank you very much, Joel, for inviting us down. It's uh, a great pleasure to, to be here. Um, as Joel says, we're really going to um, take this opportunity to offer up um, where we've got to in our thinking for this book. Um, we're going to spend, I guess, the next three or four months sitting down and, and really trying to write, write what we hope will be a pretty comprehensive first draft. And we've been agonizing for quite a while as to what should go into it. And so we're going to give you our current state of play. And if you will give us your honest reactions to it, as I'm sure you will, that would be really helpful to us. Um, and maybe bits where you feel we should be emphasizing some stuff more than other stuff, that would be great. Um, basically, the book structure is going to have a bit of, uh, it's going to start with a, a look at the, the, the phenomena we're seeing at the moment, which we're going to say is a, a new golden age of philanthropy. Um, we're then going to have some history, um, which will be very much a global history. And then we're going to devote probably about half the book to looking at you know, what's actually going on in some detail um, in uh, the leading foundations uh, that are, and, and, and charitable activities of the very rich and looking at what the context needs to be politically um, and socially, what the new social contract needs to be between the rich, well, the very rich and, and the rest of us to allow this golden age to really bear the kind of fruit that we think it could do. I wanted to start by um, really just talking about how I became interested in philanthropy, and then Mike, when he starts, will give you a bit of um, his background and, and thinking on that. Um, ironically, actually, this is, you know, we've, we've known each other since we were at high school, and it's, we've done the occasional project together over the years, and it's actually been a great pleasure to actually come back and, and have the chance to work together again. Um, but, you know, growing up in Britain, um, 
there wasn't really a great sense of, of philanthropy in the way that you will understand it, having operated in, in America. It was quite a, a strange thing. I had very much the notion of charity, and we were both involved in a homeless charity shelter, and in fact, I organized a rock concert when I was a teenager, and Mike was in a band that was in the, in the concert. So there's that kind of shared history that goes back. It was, I think, rather typical. We just about broke even and didn't really make any money for the cause. But um, that's late, like later, <laughs> we had a lot of pleasure. I'm not sure the audience had a lot of pleasure. But it was, um, um, subsequently, I, obviously, I kept, I've been working for The Economist for quite a while. Uh, the Economist, uh, we, you know, are, are obviously very committed as a, as a, as a, as an, as a newspaper, as we call ourselves, to promote campaigning for, for global, for globalisation, for free trade, for you know, uh, sort of low tax rates, um, relatively light state that doesn't interfere with the world creation process, and that was very much you know, when I joined the Economist, was our obsession with with how do we create a a culture where wealth, you know, wealth generation really happens, um, and you know clearly over the past decade and a half or two decades, that culture has taken hold in many parts of the world, and we now have seen the most spectacular period of wealth creation in human history. Um, hundreds of millions of people coming out of poverty as the communist countries, both in China and former Soviet Union, have come into the world economy. Um, and you know America and Europe growing at spectacular rates, although the European story is you know less dramatic than the American story, but you know, nonetheless Britain of all places has, has has grown from being a fundamentally sick economy in the late seventies to being one of the world's sort of great wealth creating economies again. Um, and for us at the Economist it was all you know, I think we we sort of thought that was in many ways that was the story, that it was Wealth creation was the process by which the world would escape from its problems of poverty and so forth, and that everything else would be picked up by the state operating through a safety net mechanism and, 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 and so forth. Gradually, I found that as I was um, writing and interviewing some of the people who were benefiting from that whole wealth creation process, and I was spending more time in America, um, I became more and more struck by I guess the difference in America that there was this much more profound involvement of, of foundations and, and of, the, of the wealthy. There was much more in, in the civil society here that there was a great expectation that as you became wealthy, you would start to give. And I wrote before a few. I wrote a similar article to this one in 2001 called "The New Rich," where I basically spent a lot of time going around talking to the people who'd made a lot of money over the previous 10, 20 years and just finding what made them tick, how they'd done it, what they were doing with the money. And it became very clear that a lot of them were very much thinking of giving it away and actually giving it away in, in a number of cases. Um, I got to interview Bill Gates on, for an hour on philanthropy and he was just explaining how he came to be a big philanthropist. I talked to David Rockefeller who who were clearly, you know, was a great friend of, of, of Gates and a great mentor to Gates, which I think was something to remember as we talk about the relationship between the new philanthropy and the old philanthropy. Um, you know, and he was very much talking you know, in very excited terms about the new generation of wealth coming and, and adopting a, a great American tradition. Um, and as, after that survey, I started to discover that more and more of the business people I interviewed um, were much more excited talking about their giving than they were about their wealth creation process, which initially just being a cynical journalist and even though the, the experience, I, I thought well, this is a great Trojan horse, I can, all these people that won't talk to me about their business activities, I'll ask them to talk to me about their philanthropy and, uh, and then when I'm in the room and they're excited and talking, I can <laughs> ask them a couple of tough questions on the way out. Um, as it was, um, I actually started to, I think I was still believing at that point that their philanthropy was probably a sort of a plaything, um, and that their real contribution to the world was fundamentally through their wealth creation. Um, you know, and that Gates, anything Gates did through his foundation would not um, exceed in its value to humankind um, what he did through Microsoft and, and making the PC generally available to everybody. Um, but over time, you know, I read the, the Carnegie essay on wealth. I came, came to understand 
a bit more about what was going on in terms of the cultural impact that philanthropy had had in America over the past hundred or so years. Um, and then I started, <coughs> I went back to London for three years and was business editor. And in that job, I was doing a lot of traveling to other parts of the world and meeting a lot of leading business people there. Uh, whether, and and it, it became increasingly clear that what I had thought was a kind of American exception that was in fact a trend that was taking hold among all the new or significant numbers of the new wealthy around the world, whether they be uh, an Azim Premji, the boss of Wipro, or uh, Nanda Nilakani, the boss of Infosys in India, or whether it was um, Li Kaxing in China, or I guess we see Mo Ibrahim in Africa endowing a prize recently. Um, the, in all parts of the world, the Russia, a lot of the Russian oligarchs are starting to do philanthropy. And you know, it clearly has become a global phenomenon. Um, but quite a troubling global phenomenon. At the same time, I mean, the, Ru the Russian oligarchs, you know, I I'm not entirely happy about how they made their money and so forth. There's kind of some issues around that. But clearly the, the notion of philanthropy is no longer just an American notion. It's a global um, idea. And clearly the Buffett gift Ultimately, so I wrote this. I, I, I lobbied for ages to get to write this article. Um, finally, I persuaded them to let me write it, and then two months later, Buffett gave his big donation. We did the philanthropy cover, and it just seemed to me I've been wanting to write a book for a long time. Here was a subject here, here was one that, that probably no one had really written a, a global book about um, that would deal with the relationship between a number of issues that I was very interested in, the relationship between. Uh, uh, the, the winners from globalization and society, the role of the state, um, the, the motivation of individuals and the, the, the growing role of values in, in the world um, and faith and, and all sorts of things that were going through interesting changes um, and the relationship between business and society as well all got jumbled up in this one great issue and it seemed that we were on, to me, on potentially on the threshold of, a, of this great golden age of you know, of private giving um, and private driving of, of social change, um, and that it was quite a controversial area, and that maybe the controversy has not really started to reach the point where it's really going to be in a few years' time, as, the, as more and more of the wealthy um, get into this. And it's been very striking. And I, I, I've been going to the World Economic Forum in Davos for the past three or four years, and. Clearly the notion of philanthropy is not just about giving money away, it's about using all your assets um, to affect your social mission that you, you have as a, as a wealthy individual. And it's about networking, it's about using communi public communication, it's about using political uh, systems and convening power and using your company, um, using your private investments and giving money away. All those things that so we're using in this book, a fairly broad definition of philanthropy, which is you know, the rich people using the various assets that they have control over to pursue a social mission, um, to change the world for what they conceive to be the better. Um, and so on that note, I and mean, that's where I, I'm just, that, that, that's where we got to in terms of, I then asked Mike to help with the book in order that we could get it done quickly and that we could bring his expertise, which is, he'll tell you about, to bear on the subject, which I think will complement my um, expertise very well. Um, and it's really about this golden age that we may be entering and what needs to be done to make sure that it really happens in the way it achieves, it, so that it achieves the potential it could achieve. Because at the moment I think it is very much in the balance as to whether this will be allowed to, 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 to flourish or whether some other, whether it will fail either because of its own internal contradictions and inadequacies or because of um, a, so, a political and social reaction against the rich taking this very influential role in society. Anyway, over to Mike. Thank you. Um, Fifteen years ago, uh, three important things happened to me. First of all, I finished graduate school. Secondly, uh, I abandoned all ambitions to be a rock star. Um, <laughs> and, uh, which is a very good decision. Um, and the third thing was I went uh, off to Poland to teach economics at Warsaw University under a Soros-funded programme. 
Um, and as Matthew was saying, I'd never really thought about philanthropists before. I was just having a job. I knew, I'd heard of George Soros. He was the man who'd killed the pound on Black Wednesday a few weeks before. Um, <laughs> and was an evil man, but he was going to send me off to somewhere interesting to do something interesting. Um, and so I worked there for four years. And then about ten years ago, I came back to Britain. Uh, and I became a civil servant. I joined the Department for International Development and spent several years managing our um, aid and development programs in Eastern Europe. And found myself again working a lot with Soros-funded organisations, particularly the Open Society Institute, who we found were doing some fa absolutely fantastic innovative work, particularly in Russia, around HIV and AIDS. It was subversive, it was strategic, it was really, really interesting, edgy stuff that we were putting a lot of money into. But talking to my colleagues working in other parts of the world, what was striking was that private foundations just weren't on their radar. Development was about big government donors, it was about multilateral organisations, it was some engagement with uh, non-governmental um, non organisations, but private foundations were not seen in the mainstream of development. Um, and over the last few years that's absolutely changed, um, with, particularly with Gates. There's now foundations that are much more in the, the forefront of uh, discussion about development issues. Um, and the club of donor countries, the OECD's Development Assistance Committee, so I think having a big event in March to actually talk about the role of foundations in development, which is something they haven't done for years. So something's happening, um, particularly driven by Gates, about the scale of private involvement in development. Also, in the past few years of my job, I've been overseeing our funding for non-governmental organisations in the UK. And talking to other funders, an increasing sense of frustration about traditional funding models and a great deal of interest in what's been happening in America in the last few years about new ways of funding, new forms of engagement, new ways of giving. Um, so there's sort of been a rising tide of, of, of interest in these issues. So when Matthew uh, suggested coming on board with this project, the timing was great. I should say I'm still a serving British civil servant, and I'm obliged to make the disclaimer that my comments are I've made entirely in a private capacity and <laughs> should not be construed as good British government policy in any sense. <laughs> I'm obliged to say that. Um, <laughs> what we're very keen to do is to look at philanthropy in, in its context, um, uh, both globally but also historically. Um, now, in doing so, we wanted to be very clear about how we're defining philanthropy, because I think you have very broad definitions whereby philanthropy is sort of any voluntary act of good done to another. Whereas to us what's really interesting is it's about you know, the way that global capitalism is developing, the way the super-rich are developing. So we're looking at philanthropy within capitalism. Um, so our his the historical review is really starting with the birth of capitalism and trying to track capitalism in its most advanced form, um, which is our way of justifying and focusing on Britain and America and now global capitalism. So what I want to talk to you about today is, just, uh, is to talk about what we see as being four waves of, four great waves of philanthropy that have occurred in the last 500 years. Um, and the first one begins in Tudor, England, from about 1480 onwards. Um, and I mean, this is the most exceptional period of change in Britain. This is, you know, this is the very birth period of, of capitalism. It's the end of feudalism. It's a very strange, difficult period because it's transitional. Um, <coughs> you've got so a lot of residues of feudalism carry on for a long time in this period. So quite difficult people want to change. But I, the story I like that illustrates the change that goes on in this period is the story of the Society of Merchant Venturers, which is a foundation in Bristol in the west of England. Uh, it still operates today. It's a small foundation. It gives out grants to local charities. But its history goes actually back to the 13th century, when it was set up as a trading company. Uh, and in 1497, they were one of the funders of John Cabot's Voyages of Exploration. Um, and in the 16th century, they grew ever more in financial power. And at the end of the 16th century, it started getting involved in philanthropy, establishing schools uh, and other actions like that, which have followed on. And they really typify the story of Tudor philanthropy, which is about a new form of wealth developing in these merchant classes in the trading centres, especially the ports of London and Bristol, um, who then also start developing into new types of giving. Um, it's quite frightening, actually, when you look at the kind of giving that was going on in Tudor England, um, how contemporary it was. There was a reaction against what we would call expressive giving like these days, which is seen to be the old giving by the nobles of alms to the poor, just giving out money or food. Lots of interest in uh, 
things that we might call microfinance these days, working on infrastructure issues, working on investing in human capital. I mean, none of that language was there, but a huge period of innovation in Tudor philanthropy. And what we want to do with each of these periods is say, well, what's driving um, an innovation? What's in, uh, driving a wave of innovation in philanthropy? And we're looking at four dimensions. The first one is just is uh, demographic pressure. From 30, about 1300, the British population, the English population, hit five million. Then, in the 14th century, the Black Death comes to England, and you have this huge demographic hit. And it's only by 1500 that the population of the country finally recovers back to five million. Yeah. During that period, what you saw was a huge uh, scarcity of labour, which benefited the labouring poor in Britain. So the agricultural economy contracts, but the labouring poor benefit because there's a scarcity of labour up to 1500. But with the population restored, suddenly you've got lots of labourers seeking out work. So the, the price of labour is going down. At the same time, you've had a whole change in the rural economy as, this, as the system of enclosure has incurred, which is changing farmland into pasture land which is low labour intensity. So there are fewer jobs and more people. You've also got the growth of the cities. So we're seeing this real growth of poverty in Tudor England that's a really, really big problem that's not been seen before. So that's the first driver that seems really important here, a demographic push of increasing poverty. The second one which I mentioned already is this creation of new forms of wealth from the new merchant class. Um, just to give you some data, I think over this period they reckon that about sort of, uh, the merchants made up 11% of benefactors, but 43% of benefactions. So even if they weren't as numerous as other, other philanthropists, the scale that they're giving was very big. The third set of changes we call sort of political and about the role of the state. As I said, you, you, what enclosure had done was broken up some of those old feudal relationships. Um, people were no longer tied to the land in the same way. They were free labourers moving around who didn't have the support of those feudal networks. You also have the emergence of the secular state in the 1530s. Henry VIII dissolves the monasteries to suck up their wealth, but in doing so destroys a whole welfare system that had been working through the Middle Ages. And then the third thing is in this, in this secular state is you see the emergence of the state taking an interest in charitable issues. Uh, in 1601, we get the Charitable Uses Act, the world's first regulatory law on charities. So demography, economic change, political change. And the fourth one we look at is, is sort of ideas and ideological change. <coughs> and one of the things I'm still thinking about at the moment is what was the contribution of the Reformation and Protestantism to this push of, uh, of philanthropy in Tudor England. And at the moment, I'm quite sceptical. Um, the English Re Reformation was peculiarly secular and political and wasn't driven so much by faith issues. And I'm not sure if the evidence is very strong of Protestantism being a big drive to this philanthropic impulse in the 16th century. So this is, this is the first wave. Looking at the decline of Tudor philanthropy, I think there are two factors that come in. One is that it was, in the end, proved to be insufficient to the problems. The scale of the poverty problem in England was so great at the time that the, in 1601 a poor law was brought in to provide a state-based system of welfare. And it was always assumed this would be a safety net to cover for when the private giving couldn't, uh, couldn't cope. But very quickly the poor law ever expanded its use. The state had to step in because private philanthropy couldn't cope. I'll give you an example. In London there were 24 parishes in London and private um, uh, philanthropists had been setting up uh, alms houses in these parishes, but only 10 out of the 24 parishes actually had an alms house. So you weren't getting a comprehensive system of social provision um, from private philanthropy. So there was a sense that philanthropy couldn't cope with the task. The other thing, obviously, was the political rupture in the middle of the 17th century, the Civil War, which shakes up the whole system. So this is the first uh, Tudor wave of philanthropy. The second one we see is around the, uh, the 18th century. Um, and uh, I think there's a Thomas Guy, the founder of Guy's Hospital, earns the credit as being the, uh, the first hedge fund philanthropist. Um, he was a bookseller who was making some reasonable money. 
but he uh, put his, the money he earned from book selling into the new stock market and got out of the, stock, the South Sea bubble just before it burst and made an enormous amount of money. Um, and he used that wealth to set up a, a, a guy's hospital in 1724. Um, and what we see in this period is a rise of what we call sort of subscription charities. So less wealthy individuals setting up individual foundations, but drawing on this widening sort of middle class merchant class to set up hospitals, um, and I think probably most significantly to set up the campaign against the slave trade, um, which is probably the great achievement of 18th century philanthropy. That was Guy? No, that was uh, Wilberforce. The Wilberforce, yeah. Um, now, at this period, let's look at our four drivers again. I don't see demographics as being a big driver in the 18th century. Um, obviously, there's, there is growing population, there's the poor are still with us. But there's not a big demographic shock that I can see that's driving philanthropy in this era. Economics, certainly this middle class is growing. And the innovation, of course, is the joint stock company, um, which allows people to invest in different enterprises, um, which is the origin of both Guy's Wealth and the South Sea Bubble. And people have talked about this being the era of joint stock philanthropy. So the middle class is being able to spread out their wealth among different causes by contributing small amounts, perhaps the birth of social entrepreneurs. Um, and I think a good example of that is uh, Thomas Coram, Captain Coram, Thomas Coram, who set up the Foundling Hospital in London to deal with orphans. Um, he raised the money for it, got it established, got a subscription, and then was sacked by the people who, who paid for him. So um, I think he was quite an awkward character. Uh, so he's perhaps the first social entrepreneur to uh, receive the sack. Um, so economics, I think there was a change going on there. Politics, not a lot of change I can see there either. The state wasn't really starting to encroach on the role of philanthropists in the 18th century. Um, I think we, there is in 1751, um, in the New World, the Pennsylvania General Hospital, which I think was subscription-based but a public-private partnership, which is kind of interesting. Um, and in 1756, the British Parliament made a grant to Coram's founding hospital, um, at which point subscription was dropped off. Um, so, there's an issue there. so there's just some early signs of the state starting to make some grants to these kind of uses, but not really trying to encroach on the, on the space of the philanthropist. I think what's really interesting about this period is it seems to be the great era of ideas-driven philanthropy. Um, three themes come through. The first one is the new force within religion, non-conformism of all kinds, um, whether it's pietism, Quakerism, Methodism, all those different forces really uh, push the philanthropists in this century, both within the, the formal non-conformist movements, but also within the established churches. So it seems that real sort of ideas have driven philanthropy in this period. Um, the second one, of course, this is the, you know, the dawning and strengthening of the age of science. And there's an interesting case of the Royal Humane Society. It was established in 1775. Um, and its chief uh, objective is the resuscitation of the partially drowned. Um, and the problem was that people would sort of fall into the water somewhere. Um, and they'd be hauled out and they'd look to appear to be dead. Um, and people thought they were dead. And the Royal Humane Society was actually pushing the cause that they could be resuscitated. And this was part of this push for, for modern science. Um, and then the third one, I think it's very interesting, is uh, we also see there's a big push in here of mercantilism. And this was a really important driver actually behind Coram's Foundling Hospital. Because part of the logic was, look, there are all these babies lying around, dying on the streets, literally. Um, and they're a waste of national resources. If we can raise them, they can then be productive workers who will therefore further drive our national wealth. I mean, I was thinking it's kind of crassly, but that was <coughs> the mercantilist was looking to optimise national assets. Uh, and by leaving orphans on the streets to die, we were wasting national assets and had to deploy them. So mercantilism was really important as a motivation. Um, so I think ideas were really important in the 18th century. Why does it decline? I mean, there's no, um, when I say decline, I mean, not an absolute falling off, but it runs into some problems. Um, they enjoy great success. Next month, we celebrate 200 years since the abolition of the slave trade in Britain, um, which was Wilberforce's great achievement and probably the pinnacle of 18th century philanthropy, um, even though it did occur just at the start of the 19th. 
Um, but there were plenty of other failures, including Wilberforce and his friends' efforts to set up a colony in Sierra Leone for, uh, for freed slaves, um, which had to be transferred to the Crown in 1800 because it was just running out of control. Um, there was also in the 18th century a very strong push from the non-conformist movement, movement towards the education of children through the Society for the Promotion of Christian Knowledge. Um, a huge subscription effort, many, many people coming behind this, this effort. Um, I think they managed to, at the peak, get about 30,000 children into school, which was a tiny percentage of the number of kids who needed schooling. And in a sense, in the face of the challenge, so the enthusiasm peaked out and died off. And that was a problem that subscription philanthropy faced. How do you keep people interested? And there were, of course, a few disasters, um, including the uh, very interestingly named Mounts of Piety, which I think you'd call the first revolving microcredit scheme, which was, uh, I think it was an Italian idea, um, which was to lend at zero interest to the poor, but charge interest to richer borrowers. Um, nice idea. Uh, unfortunately, the two managers ran off with all the money and it <laughs> collapsed. So there were quite a few sort of philanthropic disasters in the 18th century, um, and there were some real sort of lessons learned, and I think that drew some of the, the strength of the movement. But it gained strength again in the 19th century with perhaps the, the most known wave of philanthropy in Britain, which of course was the Victorians. Um, and I see, not due to Matthew's influence, the, this week's edition of The Economist, the Britain section, talks about the Victorians and their philanthropy. Um, I mean, where would the novels of Charles Dickens be without philanthropists and do-gooders to add his dramatic devices? Um, a survey of wills uh, in 1890 suggests that 11% of the estates of men and 25%, this is by value, of the estates of women were left to charity in this period. So on average, people were leaving, on average, 10% plus of their estates. Um, for charity. And there was a report in the Times uh, in that era that the income of charities in, in, in Britain was greater than the government revenues of Sweden, Denmark, and double that of Switzerland. Yeah? So the charity movement was massive, and the big names in British charity were very much born then. Um, and there was also the typical Victorian reforming zeal and the idea of scientific philanthropy. This wasn't just expressive stuff, this was scientific philanthropy there to really change things. So, back to our, our four drivers. What was going on? Why did the Victorians suddenly get this new energy in philanthropy? The first one is the appalling state of poverty in that, that time. I mean, the, we'd had very rapid, uncontrolled urbanisation uh, around the new industrial cities. So that actually life expectancy in Britain had dropped to the era of the Black Death. We'd gone back 500 years in human development. Absolutely appalling situation in the British cities um, around 1830, 1840. Secondly, economics. We've got two factors. First of all, a concentration of wealth. Um, a study of uh, probate records in 1858 showed that 67 people held 22% of the wealth that passed in probate that year. So massive concentration of wealth but also new groups of wealthy emerging. It's around 1850s, 1860s that we really start, 1840 maybe perhaps, that we see the industrialists of the new generation really emerging in Britain. Um, the early part of the Industrial Revolution, lots of small workshop factories rather than big factories, big companies. And it's only in the middle of the 19th century that this new industrial wealth in new areas, new people really starts to come through. Um, political change, again, very strong campaigning from the charities for the government to stay out of their business. Uh, they did not want the government being involved in fighting poverty. That was their job. Um, and the government generally did stay out, although there was some attempt to rejuvenate charities re regulation, which had kind of sort of dwindled away since the Tudor period. And then sort of ideas. I think, you know, um, the Victorian, I said, reforming, improving zeal was part of this. Um, and I think a bit of arrogance as well um, about what could be achieved, what an Englishman could achieve, was probably part of that. Um, the decline uh, of the great Victorian philanthropy was really, again, they were not sufficient for the challenge. Um, no matter how much money the charities raised, they were, not, they were just scraping the surface of the social problems in 19th century Britain. Also, at the same time, you have the emerging challenge of 
socialism and the labour movement, and a real feeling of political instability um, in Britain around the turn of the century, and a need to urgently do something about this. And philanthropic efforts aren't doing enough quickly enough, which is why very early in the 20th century, we see the Liberal government comes in 1906. In 1909, it passes the big welfare legislation, the People's Budget, that sets Britain on the course for sort of a corporatist, big state, high taxation arrangement that prevails through to well after the Second World War. And we also see in that period of very, very strong anti-charity attitudes. Uh, government provides things by right, it provides things fairly. Charities, philanthropists are capricious, unfair, unjust, very big host hostility. And that runs then through for a long period. The fourth great wave, um, which takes me onto your home territory and off mine, so do forgive me, is of course um, the, well, yeah, the end of the 19th century, start of the 20th century here in the US. Um, two names only required, Carnegie and Rockefeller. I mean, we'd welcome your thoughts on this. This is really sort of off my turf. But the drivers there seem to be clearly there's, you know, there's a, the demographic issue. You've, you've got immigration, urbanisation, slums, poverty, increased awareness of social problems. That's creating a driver. You've also got this creation of super wealth for the first time um, anywhere. Um, in 1907, Lord Allendale, a British landowner, one of the richest men of the country, died and left an estate of £3.2 million. 1907 was also the year that Rockefeller became a billionaire. So you've got this huge divergence in the, the scale of wealth, and this is a kind of wealth that's never been heard of before. Um, so, that's, that's, so there's an economic driver there. And then the emerging role of the state, I suppose here we have the emergence of the progressive agenda, a challenge to big business, is philanthropy a response to that challenge and that concern? And then in terms of ideas, um, there's a very strong sense from, from Carnegie's writing about Darwinism, etc. Um, so that's the, the, the phase, and I very much welcome your thoughts on that. Um, the decline of this phase, well it must come with the Depression, with the New Deal. Um, and some sense of perceived failure or voluntary action in that, that time. Um, but never a retreat from, from philanthropy as in Britain or the rest of Europe. Uh, it's more of a setback than a real reversal as happens in Europe. Um, so just very quickly, if we take our four, four me sort of measures of how to spot a great wave of philanthropy, um, what does that, how does that stack up against where we are today? Well, first of all, on the demography side, um, Matthew said we're living in a period of spectacular wealth creation. We also live in a period of spectacular population growth, and we really are running to stand still in terms of global poverty. Um, so there's a, I think that's there. That's there as an issue. And that's, that problem is squared by the fact we're now hitting the sustainability <coughs> constraints set by climate change. So I would argue that we are hitting yeah, a massive social problem um, that's really you know, driving, looking for solutions. Uh, secondly, as Matthew was saying, super wealth is back with global markets, winner takes all markets. We have multi billionaires with a wealth that's never been heard of before, especially by people in their 30s. Um, so, astonishing wealth is back. Um, and we're also seeing super wealth being spread much more globally. I mean, the wealthy in Britain have never been wealthier, I think. Um, we're seeing super wealth in Russia and in India all over the place. So, that seems to be interesting and new. The third one, in terms of politics and the role of the state, I mean, if you look at the previous waves of philanthropy, there's this kind of a ratchet effect with the state ever moving more in to, to take an ever greater role. We're now at a point where the state is very clearly saying, we cannot do more, we need to do less, we're overstretched. And I think this is what makes this a very interesting period, where we are now, is what's going to be the relationship between private action and public action when the state is looking to renegotiate the deal? And the story here in The Economist is actually about the British government is saying at the moment it wants to match fund private donations to universities because we have such a poor record in attracting donations and supporting higher education. So the government is essentially saying that we're not going to be able to finance higher education ourselves as we have done for a long period of time. We need private money to lever in as well. Um, so the, the changing role of the state. Um, in terms of ideas, I don't think we get something kind of slightly difficult. Um, from what Bill Gates says as his motivation, 
was reading the Human Development Report. So there seems to be some sense about we have a global responsibility. The idea of universal human rights seems to be one driver here. But also against the, the trend of universal rights, we also have a sort of a movement that seems to be against um, trying to find universal truths. We seem to be more happier with you know, different truths, different paradigms. You know, I, I hate to utter the word postmodernism. Um, it's slightly ugly. But since, you know, is, it, is there a fragmentation of the value system? What's that going to be? I don't know. That's just throwing that one out. Um, just to finish off, uh, historical survey. I think we've identified three critiques of philanthropy that the new philanthropists need to address. The first one is the source of wealth. Where does it come from? And there's a hard and a weak form of this critique. The hard form is obviously the Marxist labour theory of value. Yeah? Any wealth that a capitalist has earned has basically been stolen from the workers. Um, therefore, all wealth is theft. Um, and that's one that you'll find uh, repeated in a, there's a British classic socialist text from the early 20th century, The Ragged Trousered Philanthropists. And that's all about how the, the poor are the true philanthropists because it is their money that's being stolen by the rich. Um, and this, I mean, I wouldn't want to take this one too seriously, but it is being bandied around by some cultural commentators like Slavoj Žižek at the moment. So that strong version uh, is around, but perhaps not so important. There's another version of this argument, though, on the source of wealth, which I think goes back to Ida Tarbell and the attack on the robber barons, which links into the attack on you know, the source of Gates's money or the source of Abramovich's money. Is it good wealth? Is it wealth that's been earned in the right way? Because if it's been earned in the wrong way and therefore hasn't been a good thing, that doesn't, philanthropy doesn't justify that. So there's still a line of attack on philanthropists about how the money has been earned. Is it good wealth? The second uh, set of attacks is around the plutocracy critique, um, which, um, which uh, we see quite strongly you know, people evoking sort of Jeffersonian fears about the rise of the wealthy taking over control of society. Uh, I think most recently sort of Kevin Phillips will be writing about that here. Again, that's kind of a strong version of that argument. A weaker and perhaps more interesting version of that argument is looking at about how are philanthropists dabbling in politics. Certainly George Soros, both here in the US and in other countries, has gotten very involved in some interesting ways. Um, what would, how would this fit with the Bloomberg run for the presidency? Um, you can even go back to Ford Foundation work on civil rights issues. There's, a, there's some stuff there about foundations, philanthropists meddling in politics that's a, a potential critique. And then the third one, of course, is effectiveness. And here, too, there are sort of two levels of critiques. The first one is, look, philanthropy will always be peanuts. It's not going to make any big difference. It's just a, a marginal sort of activity. And I think you'll find that argument in uh, Thomas Hobbes's Leviathan somewhere. So that's, that critique's been around for a while. But again, I think it's, it's a, sort of too extreme. Um, because I think philanthropy is about finding niches and not duplicating the mass scale of spending the government will be doing. The more important critique about effectiveness is, is philanthropy effective? Is it really interested in impact? Uh, a debate you'll be familiar with, uh, and to which I commend you all, the excellent book by Joel Fleischman. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so uh, the, the historical review that will, we'll, uh, and then the, the, the emergence of those critiques, um, you know, is partly just to say there's nothing new, I mean, about new philanthropy. I mean, all, every issue that we're, in, we're dealing with today um, you know, it seems to have surfaced at some point over the last 500 years, um, and uh, there are lessons to be learned from that. I mean, secondly, I think what comes through um, that analysis for me and uh, is firstly that these four we need to address these four categories that Mike has has uh, highlighted, and and to really figure out you know what is the ideological environment, what is the economic change, what's the demographic change, what's the the fourth one was political. Political, the political context. But it seems to me what really comes through is that as capitalism evolves and goes through new periods of, of dramatic wealth creation, so the philanthropy tends to reflect the, the capitalism of, of the day in various ways. Um, and therefore, as we've been through this 20-year period of amazing wealth creation, um, and I think there's another, you know, as, as the various technological changes and market changes that are underway um, you know, feed through, you know, touch wood, we're going to have many more decades of very dramatic growth. 
Um, so you would expect a philanthropy that comes out of that to reflect many of the insights of, and, and, and models of capitalism. And at the moment we're in essentially a period of, of market-based global capitalism. And as you look at the language that's particularly coming out of the new philanthropists, but I think also is increasingly there in the, the language of the existing foundations as they get affected by the change and try and uh, you know, accommodate themselves to, to the, um, the, the forces that are at work. Um, you know, there are a number of things that reflect that market-based global capitalism. And in this survey, um, I really talk about the birth of philanthropic capitalism, um, which is the development of a philanthropy that uses the language and insights and, and methods of that market-based global capitalism in this particular sense. And it is obviously a caricature of what's going on, but I think it's, it's useful to use this framework in the sense that there is, first and foremost, as an investor, a social investor, which is the new way of looking at the philanthropist. There is um, an infrastructure, a market infrastructure, which is consists of various intermediaries. And then there is the entity in which the social investor invests, who um, seems to be calling itself the social entrepreneur, very much in the way that in the for-profit world the, um, the venture capitalist invests in the entrepreneur. Um, I just want to go through each of those, those three sections and just sort of highlight a number of thoughts about what's going on. Um, it seems to me that on the investor side, there's a real focus on results and impact. Um, the, 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 at the heart of this transformation from being a, a philanthropist to being a social investor is, is the notion that you're interested in not just the expressive philanthropy, the act of giving, but the act of effective giving, you want results, um, demonstrable impact, and and, and, you're, and you and you and you think strategically about this because you know you don't get results without in business without thinking strategically, and so why would you in philanthropy? And Gates is you know, is the easy and obvious example of this. I mean, here's someone who wants to eradicate all preventable deaths amongst children in the developing world. And that's a pretty ambitious goal. It's uh, clear. It requires a strategy, um, and he's going after it. And we will know pretty clearly whether he succeeds or, or whether he fails. Um, a second theme in the language is this emphasis on this term leverage or leverage, as we call it in England. Um, and you know, this this is really coming out of the hedge fund and finance community where, who are you know, massive philanthropists, largely un under-reported, I think, the extent of their philanthropy because they really don't want, I think that they're, they're, they see themselves as essentially private equity, private investors, and they, their philanthropy is in a similar private mindset. Um, but I think huge amounts of activity going on. Um, Slightly toe curling at times. I've just been invited to an event called Hedge Funds Against Poverty, which is going to be, uh, <laughs> going to be held in the in Las Vegas. At the Win Complex, the Win Complex. So um, they'll find people who lose all their money. Exactly. I think that's right. Maybe that. <laughs> in my book, yeah. 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 but there's a lot right going there. on. This concept of leverage is really I mean, partly about um, the fact there are quite, you know, compared to um, you know, the sorts of money that's being, uh, uh, and the sort of money that's being thrown at various social problems by state and multilateral agencies and so forth, um, the amount, even Gates' money, is small by comparison. And so there's a sense that to have demonstrable impact, you need to be very careful in focusing where you put your money so that you put it at the place in the system where it can have the maximum um, impact. Uh, and what, but, but the flip side of there being these alternative forces, whether it be the state or large multinational companies and so forth, is actually those are assets that um, 
you know you can use your money effectively to to mobilize and towards the causes that you care about so in fact it's if you put your little amount of money in the right place arguably you're going to have a multiplier effect that's that's massive and and so you see I mean, the emergence of somewhere like the World Economic Forum with Davos as, as being a place where uh, political actors, um, corporations, NGOs all get together. And the rich are unbelievably influential in terms of convening people, getting them to sit down together, getting companies to um, go along with their schemes for CSR reasons and all sorts of things. Um, and politicians no longer, um, the, any rich person knocking at their door is going to get a, a, a warm embrace rather than, um, rather than be sent on their way, which is quite a dramatic change in the past 20 years outside of America, certainly. Um, and so you see the sorts of things like, um, let's take the, the one campaign here uh, around the G8 summit two years ago. I mean, you had Bono, the rock star, goes to Bill Gates and says, I want to campaign for massive debt forgiveness. Um, I want to set up an organization called Data that will be the driving force of that. And Gates says, well, look, I'll give you a million if you can find two other people to give you a million dollars of seed finance. And so he gets Soros and a guy called Ed Scott to, to put up a million. So you have three million seeds in this organization. Um, that Bono then uses to get other donations from wealthy philanthropists. He then goes and forms alliances with um, NGOs, existing NGOs, and with the church organisations, um, and with politicians like Tony Blair. And in the end, they will claim that they, for that initial three million of seed capital, that they've managed to generate, you know, several billion dollars of benefit to poor countries, which is by even hedge fund standards. A pretty remarkable bang for the buck. Um, X prizes are now being seen as sort of another way that you can get some leverage. So Larry Page at, at Google um, is hosting an event for the X Prize organisation in a couple of weeks' time to try and persuade other philanthropists to donate large amounts of money to endow about a dozen new prizes over the next couple of years. And he, Larry Page, according to, to the X Prize Foundation, has said to them that if I give a, a dollar to um, an educational establishment, I probably get about uh, 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 50 cents on the dollar value for money out of that investment. If I give it to the to endow, uh, if, I, if there's a matching grant, I'll get two bucks, maybe two bucks for the dollar return on my investment. If I give it to a prize, I'll get 10 times. But if I give it to the X Prize Foundation, because they're organizing the prizes, they're the infrastructure, um, I'll get 100 times you know, my money in terms of impact, in terms of leverage. So that's very much the way someone like, you know, I guess you couldn't get more of the archetypal new philanthropist than, than, than the Google guys, and, and that's how they're seeing it. Um, and then there's this focus on, on um, efficient, efficient organizational growth, um, which is very much one of the uh, real innovations in the world for profit economy over the past 20 years has been a sense that we really understand how to manage an efficient company. And we know how to grow them, we know how to manage them once we've grown them. And there's this phenomenon of venture philanthropy, which you know, actually was named in the 1970s, I think, by a Rockefeller, but is very much has been one of the catchphrases of the past decade or so. Um, it's about high engagement. Um, by the, uh, the venture philanthropist. So, you know, you, you are actually seeing people very much personally involved. I mean, the fact that they're wealthy at such a young age means that the, the founder is able to personally be involved in it. And I think it'll be, you, you see a lot of them having learned the lesson that you don't want to have a foundation that maybe goes on many years after your death because it becomes very much less engaged, at least in the issues you want to be engaged in. Um, and um, there's a desire for scale. Uh, you want to grow organizations. That's very much in the venture philanthropy thing. You want to build an institution. Um, and you 
you see that as one sign of success that you've done that. I'm intrigued by, I suppose, the fact that if you look at the for-profit world, you see venture philanthropy, venture capital, <coughs> and you see private equity. I think you see less of the private equity model being applied so far in in philanthropy, but I think you will see more of it in the sense that you take a mature organisation and you try and use your uh, foundation money to really transform the efficiency of, of, a, of an established non-profit. Um, and maybe that's going to emerge as a, as a theme, sort of venture private, uh, so private equity philanthropy or philanthropic private equity or something like that. Um, and um, you know, I, I suppose this, this sense that um, one of the things that has happened in the for-profit world has been, certainly in the developed world, has been uh, a focus of, on core competences of companies and trying to become less conglomerate, diversified conglomerates and more sticking to what you do best. And so, in principle, you hear the new philanthropists in particular talking about focus, although in fact I think they haven't really yet, in some cases, discovered what their core competence is, and so they seem to be you know, um, reaching around to find the right issues to focus on. But certainly Gates is saying we have, traditionally we had three main pillars of activity, now they're adding a fourth, um, because they're just so big and they don't know how to spend the money. But um, yeah, there is still this notion that we need to focus, otherwise we become hugely inefficient and bureaucratic and like the worst kind of conglomerates. Um, then there's some other interesting themes. I, I find this one of the most perplexing areas and one that I'd be fascinated to get your reactions to um, is this combination within a single institution of for-profit and non-profit activities. Um, so you see it with the Omidyar networks where Pierre Omidyar, the founder of eBay, initially um, set up a classic foundation, but then he felt that he was being constrained from invest from supporting certain of the missions that he wanted to do. His, his mission is to facilitate individual self-empowerment, um, and you know, which might seem somewhat self-contradictory. Anyway, um, that uh, in terms of he, he now has a single team in his networks who will consider all proposals and only at the very last phase will they decide whether it should be regarded as a for-profit investment or a non-profit grant or loan or whatever. And then you have the Google, google.org which was initially going to be a classic foundation but is now just a division of Google um, and it's not quite clear to me how, how it's going to be held accountable, whether what restrictions will be placed on what it does, whether it will also be pursuing for-profit and non-profit activities, but it will certainly be, it doesn't enjoy any of the tax advantages of a classic foundation as part of the Google Corporation, um, and it will be very interesting to watch. And then we have, I suppose, the other side of the coin, which is corporate philanthropy and corporate social responsibility. I mean, it's absolutely clear now that, you know, in a way that companies didn't 20 years ago, that, that they now, you have to have a social mission in some sense as a company. It's not enough just to be the best widget, well, because you can be the best widget manufacturer in the world, but you probably need to do it in at least a sustainable way um, nowadays. Um, that there is this sense that the, the for-profit world and the non-profit world are no longer completely separate tracks that they are fusing, partly because uh, certainly the more interesting human capital based businesses um, motivation of workers and recruitment of workers requires you to have a sort of social feel but also because I think part one of the successes of the development of the global uh, civil society that's happened is that you have maximum the, the, the corporations are being held to astonishingly high levels of accountability and, and the transparency of, of, of their supply chain you know, is, 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 is meaning that you know, some, a worker in, in Africa that may be working under oppressive conditions for one of your contractors you know, can damage your brand you know, perhaps irreparably. And so um, there is a sense in which your corporate social responsibility and your foundation needs to be acting uh, in, 
a very coordinated way with your core mission as a business, and that um, you know, traditional corporate foundations, which may have been more of a sort of piggy bank for the chairman to support his pet causes, is no longer an acceptable way forward for, and, and shareholders are increasingly going to demand that um, foundations and so forth be brought into line with the corporate mission. So I don't know where all that's going, but it sort of fascinates me, and I think it's going to be very interesting to see where that goes. Then we have potentially, I guess, the emergence of a market for foundations um, it's themselves, in, in a sense that the Buffett gift to Gates seems to me to be a, you know, a classic Buffett. He, you know, he backs a, in his professional life, he was an investor who made a few big bets on firms that he considered um, winners, and he clearly doesn't have any interest in spending his days doing philanthropy, but he feels he ought to give his money away, and therefore he's giving it to what he regards as the best in breed out there in the marketplace. Now, I, I think we, we will see one of the consequences of Buffett's generosity being inspiring other um, other similarly or nearly as wealthy people to, do, to look for other opportunities to give their money to someone else to do the giving for them. However, um, there's a real question about whether they can do that with much confidence and whether the foundations themselves are able to persuade them um, that that's a wise, wise place to put their money for all the classic reasons that we've seen in the past that foundations don't, haven't um, always taken much heed of what their founder uh, wanted them to do once the founder had departed the scene. Um, and so, but, so we're going to have a lot of, I think, interesting developments happening around that model. Then we have two other themes, or three other themes that are around in terms of um, what's been going on in the for-profit world that's also playing into the non-profit world. One is um, you know, the growing importance of human capital um, generally in business, and I think you're seeing that reflected in a new wave of interest in education as um, a way that philanthropists should focus their money. A second is um, in the for-profit world you see this phenomenon called co-opetition where firms are simultaneously both competing and cooperating with um, each other. And I think you'll see that in the more and more in the philanthrop philanthropic world where uh, foundations are, are more willing to partner with themselves, also with governments and NGOs and with for-profit companies. Um, and yet at the same time, ego being very important in philanthropy, this competitive impulse will also be there, and it'll be interesting to see whether, whether they can manage this as well as businesses seem to be managing competition nowadays. And then finally, globalization. Um, it shouldn't really be finally, but it, it's just at the end of the list here. But um, globalization, clearly, I mean, one of the things that's happened is that um, you know, increasingly, it seems that the global problems, the problems outside of the rich countries are where philanthropists feel the need to put more of their money. Um, and that's partly because you have reasonably effective welfare systems in, in the developed countries, um, and you can see that the terrible problems that are emerging in, the, in parts of the developing world where they haven't got such advanced state systems. Um, and secondly, though, I mean, I think, and I think that trend will grow more and more. Um, obviously, there are domestic issues that will require philanthropic activity, and you know, Mike's talked about how the states everywhere are kind of reducing their or trying to reduce their role. But I think we're all painfully aware of, say, an issue like AIDS in Africa or um, whatever uh, the climate change issue, um, the lack of education in many parts of the world, and how educating may reduce population growth. And then finally, I guess we're seeing some threats. Um, potentially, you know, uh, philanthropists with different values coming out of the new wealthy in the developing world. Um, and we saw, for example, the concern about the funding of terrorist activities by Arab foundations. Um, Giuliani famously rejecting Prince Al-Walid's gift to New York after 9-11. Grounds that the, uh, van, uh, the, the Walid was allegedly anti-Semitic. Um, so a whole load of issues around the, the, the social investors. I really want to have time for discussions. Good. I don't know how, we, how are we doing? For We're time? doing fine. I think okay. we'll get on with the discussion whenever you're ready. Okay. okay. I just well very quickly two two things. Social entrepreneurs. Um, 
I think the, the term has really caught on. It reflects um, a desire to engage with the social investor type philanthropist in a, in a language of business. Um, I think the term is a bit woolly. It's not clear who is a social entrepreneur. I think a lot of people like to call themselves social entrepreneurs because it sounds cool. Um, there are also genuine entrepreneurs who are absolutely interested just in making money, but are within that social entrepreneur sect, and there are people who are never going to make any money from doing it in the same group, which is somewhat confusing. Um, what's the real test of success? I, mean, I would say scale of, if you look at a, a real a, 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 a for-profit entrepreneur, the success is you build a scalable large organization that's worth a lot of money. Um, so scalability is a test of success for social entrepreneurs, but I don't think that necessarily means building a big organization. If you create a model, an idea that is widely adopted, even if it's by lots of other people, um, I think that kind of open source solution um, may be a success just as much or even more so than building a big organization, because you're not really in it for the money. Um, but you're seeing the emergence of serial social entrepreneurs, which I think is, again, a very interesting new phenomenon. Um, you're seeing... Say a word about what you mean by serial social entrepreneurs. Well, I mean, let's say that there's someone, for example, who, uh, an Indian social entrepreneur called Jeru, Jeru Bilineria, who set up something called Childline in India, which was uh, giving lots of street kids a phone number they could call if they were being harassed, a free phone number. Um, and then she's, that, that organization has been taken over by the Indian government. Um, and she's now running an organization that's designed to teach financial literacy to children. So she's so there's a sense in the same way that in the entrepreneurial world, right. you know, you, you create your company, you sell it off, you do you, you go on to do your next business, you're seeing that emerge with social entrepreneurs. And you're also seeing what I find quite interesting, a number of mature or maturing organizational issues um, coming to the fore where again I think there'll be a lot of learning from the for profit world. So succession issues are big now for a lot of social entrepreneurs. Um, particularly the number of them, the issue is how do you get the social entrepreneur to, to move on in a number of cases um, and replace a professional manager in there. Um, you also see, which I find quite fascinating, quite a strong dislike of the new philanthropy amongst a lot of mature organisations that have been around a while, which to me reminds me very much of how corporate America, say, regarded uh, the LBO people in the 1980s as barbarians of the gate. And I suspect we're going to see a similar... Uh, evolution to, to, to the barbarians becoming extremely welcome as time goes by, but I think it may be a painful process getting there. <laughs> and then finally, the intermediaries. Um, I mean, to me, this is the most potential, the hardest area to get to, to know what's going to happen. Um, but there are, it seems to me, if you, uh, a lot of innovations going on around intermediaries in philanthropy. It's still pretty small, and you know, on leverage grounds, you would hope that philanthropists would see that to be the area to put their money to get the maximum bang for their buck, because if you can create an infrastructure that makes philanthropy much more efficient and effective, um, you would presumably feel you're getting fantastic value for money. Can you define um, the I will come on, I'll just come on to, to talk a bit about that. Um, I mean, if you look at the for-profit world over the last 20 to 30 years, I think that what's driven a lot of the efficiency gains and wealth creation has been much more effective intermediaries, particularly coming out of the capital markets, where you see investment banking, um, transparency in stock markets, um, an understanding of financial risk management um, and leverage of uh, mutual funds and, and activist share, share, shareholders, um, a proliferation of financial products that have given firms all sorts of new ways of of raising money to meet particular goals, uh, a great improvement in um, regulation of financial markets, um, and you know, generally a focus on much, much better understanding of performance and of the direction of money to where you get real results. And so what you're seeing in, I mean, I, which I really deal with in what I call the, cha the chapter called Virtues Intermediaries at the end of the business of, of giving survey, is in each of those areas that you've seen in um, the for-profit world, you're seeing some firms or some operations emerging that are, are, pa are, are kind of similar in, in structure to, to, to those in the for-profit world. So you're seeing data providers, so you're seeing GuideStar, for example, which you know, uh, 
is, is spreading around the world. Um, you're seeing research firms and analysts. So you see a firm like New Philanthropy Capital in the UK, which was set up by um, uh, with money from the Goldman Sachs IPO by a Goldman Sachs uh, partner, um, which is trying to do what a research investment research arm of an investment bank would do um, in terms of analysing uh, different sectors of the, of the non-profit world in the UK. Um, or you've got Geneva Global over here, or you've got um, the Centre for Effective Philanthropy, um, which I guess Joel knows all about um, here. You're also seeing the emergence of advice, advisory firms and consulting firms. Um, so you see that McKinsey having a significant non-profit business. You see Bridgespan set up by a former head of, of Bain. <coughs> a real excellent consulting work to, to non-profits and foundations. You see the equivalent of investment banking operations, so there's something called the non-profit um, finance, uh, financial, what's it called, finance fund, non-profit finance fund capital partners, um, which is trying to do more innovative uh, forms of fund raising for, for um, NGOs. Um, and you're seeing money management firms emerging as intermediaries. So, I mean, I guess the Acumen Fund would be an obvious example, which is getting a lot of backing from Google at the moment, which it takes and invests in actually in for profit activities as well as non profit activities, but isn't seeking to make a financial return on the money. On the other hand, you see efforts like um, Amidiars to create for profit microfinance models that are actually designed to produce um, you know, virtuous. Uh, uh, virtuous financial returns to to investors and foundations, and I guess we're going to see this big issue that was raised recently by the LA Times about the Gates Foundation's asset allocation um, coming more and more to the fore, which will create more and more um, sources of capital to, I think, inventive um, investment banking intermediaries. So the question is, are you know, are are foundations all going to have to? Increasingly, um, direct their assets to um, to socially approved um, sources. I think Gates is very reluctant to go down that route um, and regards it as uh, such an undeveloped area that he doesn't want to put his money into any social vehicles. But um, I think that may create more impetus to this intermediary role. So, um, and then there's also, I think, going to be greater focus on more efficient regulation of the sector as well, particularly about transparency and also accountability. Um, and that will all be driven by the intermediaries if that can get off the ground. And as I say, that is a big if. So we have two, I, I really want to throw it over to the discussion now, but two concluding points. Um, you know, it's, this whole area is very much you know, full of promise, but in question as to whether it will achieve the promise it needs to. Partly it will be because of you know, how does the how do these various initiatives actually unfold over time? Will they will they work as well as people hope they're going to work? And the lack of the equivalent of profit, some simple measure in the philanthropic world and may may actually be a bigger hindrance than people think at the moment. The other is, you know, how is society as a whole going to react to the rich playing much bigger role. We've heard the critiques that Mike brought out. I think there is a growing concern about inequality um, and a, a, you know, a sense of a backlash against the rich. Um, and the more the rich pursue a social agenda, that could go two ways. It could go, it could buy off some of that hostility, but equally it may raise more and more questions. And I think we're going to conclude the book by arguing that there needs to be some sort of new social contract struck that allows the rich um, to be, um, it sets the ground rules by which the rich can play the role that they can play in society. I think it is important that they get the opportunity if they do it well because um, a really effective uh, philanthropist can innovate in ways that a, and that a government in particular can't and can find more imaginative and creative solutions and therefore I think there is a very important role for them to play. But I think we are going to need to see a new social contract struck between the rich and society. And I think it's, it's not clear to me that philanthropists that I talk to really understand that at the moment. And that, you know, that's going to be an area that hopefully the book will 
encourage them to focus on. So with that, it's rather a long terrific, presentation. Absolutely but, uh, terrific and, uh, and full of opportunities for questions and comments. I think Kristen had her hand up first. Uh, this is going to be a great book. I'm looking forward to reading it and reading it. Um, it sounds like you guys want to, you know, want to do more than uh, simply sort of document um, the variety of philanthropy over time and across nations, but also to explain that variation. And so you talked about you've got two cases um, where you're looking at different periods of time, the U.S. and, and the U.K., and, and then you've got this sort of uh, cross-national comparison, as I understand it. And and um, Matthew, I think you said something that just really made my ears prick up. You said that um, you think the philanthropy reflects the capitalism of the day. So you've got multiple cases cross nationally and over time to sort of test that. Is that is that sort of the overarching theory and, and the argument of the book? And if, if so, could you say a little bit more about how and why? Yeah, I, I think uh, Mike would probably be better on the history, but I, I think we were very struck by the joint stock philanthropy of the uh, 18th century. Um, reflecting very much the notion of you, know, you spread, you can sort of raise capital more broadly and by sharing a bit of the uh, control with a broader audience. Um, I think the, um, you, know, you look at the robber baron who became philanthropists, I mean they very much were all about you know, building big structures of integrating uh, into large entities and they created these large institutions that took on big problems in a very sort of linear way. Um, it took 30 years to find a cure for something, uh, for the yellow fever or whatever. And, and so there was a sort of Fordist almost approach to, to what they were doing. And I think now you're going to see much more network, uh, philanthropy, uh, open source type of activities, this ambivalence, I mean, around the role of for-profit and non-profit and where it all mixes together, I think is very much going to be one of the themes of of this new philanthropy, and, and that's where Google is so interesting to me because they, you know, they made their money overnight. They richer than anyone could ever imagine. They feel from day one they want to be philanthropists, but they also want to be investors. They don't need the money, but they still will put some money into for-profit forms because that just seems a more sensible way for that particular goal to be done. It doesn't seem to them that they're, in any sense, I think they believe they're entirely good wealth. So the whole. Be, don't be evil philosophy of Google. So there's no sense that they've exploited any worker whatsoever. In fact, people workers die to work for, for Google. And so mm -hmm. there's a feel good nature that even Gates, I and mean, there's the antitrust accusations that have somewhat dogged his plan, make his plans be somewhat seem like a big leaf, although the scale of it is way beyond what he would need to have done to, for, for that to be the case. But so, so Google is the sort of model of. Pure, the pure capitalist, pure philanthropic capitalist entity in a way. And so, I, but I have no idea what they're going to do and whether, and whether their goal, which is to do more, have a, change the world more through google.org than through google.com, you know, is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a reasonable aspiration or not. I mean, it's anyone's guess, frankly. And, I, and who knows what they're going to do with it. And they've hired this hex doctor from the Grateful Dead. Um, to run the foundation. <laughs> but that's probably belittling him somewhat. <laughs> but um, it's, it's a fascinating. So I don't know, have you got any thoughts on that? The thing is, is, I think understanding the context in which philanthropy is happening is so important. An example I'll give there would be Russia, where there seems to be a boom in philanthropy emerging, big emergence of corporate social responsibility. But actually, I mean, one thing we need to explore a bit is you know, how much is that actually about a contract between the oligarchs and the state? where actually that's a permission for them to have the wealth that they've essentially been given by the state. Uh, so that's going to be a very, very different philanthropic model emerging in Russia in that context of Russian capitalism. So you have to understand the capitalism to understand the philanthropy of the trends. I'm, I'm, can and can't I'm sort of fascinated by Carlos Slim, for example, where the, 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 the Mexican telecoms uh, billionaire who has started to become a philanthropist and was at the Clinton Global Initiative you know, talking about his philanthropy, but you know, is is clearly charging outrageously high telecoms uh, prices in uh, all over Latin America, and it's quite clear from the development literature that you know low cost telecoms have been fantastic in terms of generating economic growth that particularly helps the very poor, and so you know you could argue have a lot a very interesting argument about whether his philanthropy is he's hoping to to kind of avoid political pressure to 
for deregulation and for lower cost prices. And actually, his philanthropy is, in that sense, big leaf philanthropy rather than kind of real fundamental socially desirable philanthropy that you know, we want to advocate. No, I'm reflecting, I'm kind of just want to just insert something right here that, that was triggered by this the question and the remark. It suddenly made me think about the extent to I mean the extent to which, for example, Carnegie did not use uh, what the the business, the for profit forms, including except in one place with TIAA Craft. Um, you know, it, and it might be worthwhile just take, you know, taking a look and see, seeing some of the others because if there was one person, as you know from reading the Gospel of Wealth, who thought that he was doing the same kinds of things in his philanthropy that he was doing in his, that, in, that he'd done in his business, it was Carnegie. And I just wonder if there may be other or not. Maybe, maybe they weren't. Uh, but God knows he was certainly a practitioner of scientific management and just uh, you know, through and through the way he went about doing the things that he did. And anyway, Fritz. Well, I echo Chris's remarks as a fabulous talk, and I hope it'll be very interesting. Um, yeah, Chris is ready to use it you know, yeah, already. Yeah, You've I'll got your first course. Well, yeah. Yeah. Your Amazon sales rate. Right. <laughs> <laughs> My first class is next Tuesday, so. I was, I mean, among, among several things that are fairly fascinating was the, just the sweep of this, like Kristen, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the this uh, sense of, the, of, the, of waves of, of philanthropy and the drivers, both of the rise and decline of that struck me as, as very interesting. And the, the interaction between, on the one hand, uh, the, the market forces would produce wealth in great numbers, uh, great amounts, the vacuums of dem driven by demography or globalization or other things that create a need or, or a problem in society. And to some extent, varying either capacities or ideas about the role of the state, and the role of the extent to which the state or the, or the private sector is the place where this, where this happens, seems to me a really useful way of, of thinking about what's going on. Reminding me of work I've been doing on uh, globalization, <coughs> and thinking in a kind of Polonian sense about the way in which markets have been um, disembedded from the societal and governmental structures that once governed and seeing the command uh, of governance as a, as a response to a vacuum or a lot of capacity. So, I'm wondering, so that struck me as very interesting. But I guess the question I would pose is looking at this wave and in particular thinking about the causes of the declines of the ways in which these other waves have failed. One of the things I thought I heard from my keeps saying over and over again, I mean, there were many, many factors, but one of them was this. Uh, Adequate, so the sense of disappointment of inadequacy of the of, of philanthropy to realize the ambitions that it had. And here we're at another golden age, enormous amount of money, and yet, of course, even greater ambition in some sense. And I wonder if you look at that, you, you started at the end of talk about some of the, the, the ways this could fail, but if you could elaborate further, if you look at the current thing, how do you, if this, when this, if this is going to fail, what would be the ways in which it would fail? It also be one in which the uh, however clever, however leveraged, however many X prizes there are, somehow this wave uh, is ultimately disappointing or fails to realize its ambitions. Well, I mean, there are any, any number of ways. I think you're right. I mean, I, I think, um, I mean, it seems to me the, the prizes, you know, if you look at what the X Prize Foundation is looking at, they're looking at prizes in education and in development. And I think the history of prizes, they work much better when there's a very clear uh, trigger for the prize being awarded. And it's very hard to conceive of what would be a, an unambiguous and appropriate goal for an educational prize or a development prize. And yet, this early in its life, the X Prize Foundation feels the need to come up with prizes in that area. And so I think the amber challenge is I mean, certainly according to Joel's book, one of the great wastes of $500 million that humankind has managed. And so um, how do you avoid that? And I, I'd be interested in what Joel's lessons were on, on how you would avoid you know, failing in that area. But equally, um, you know, the, uh, the Sierra Leone example, I think, 
is very instructive for anyone reading the work of Jeffrey Sachs, and Jeff Sachs is very, you know, very much at the heart of many of these uh, throw money at the problem uh, approaches that some of the foundations around Gates are, are looking at. Um, the Millennium Villages thing that he's doing, you know, I think, is already showing signs of wear and tear. And he's obviously he's the star speaker at the Hedge Funds Against Poverty event. And so again, I, mean, I think having, I, I'm personally very skeptical about a lot of what Sachs says. And so you know, there is a danger that the just as the aid community, official aid community, until ten years ago, had become very depressed by the money to deliver results. I think a lot of philanthropists are going to find potentially that they get quite depressed by the the results unless they are very careful in thinking through how they do it. And I, I mean, that's why I think. I quite like what Gates is doing on public health because that seems to me to have a clear strategy and it's based around a clear sense of where the market failure is and how you can use money to stimulate answers in development. It's just an awful lot more difficult and Gates is getting into development because he's got to spend the bucket money on something and that seems the likeliest area. But clearly education has been, and you'd you know this, and been just in your thoughts, it's been very hard to deliver no, any tangible just, progress in education. I'm just uh, overwhelmed by this. I think what you're doing is terrific. This big picture is just, just terrific. Um, yeah, the one concern I have is just what you've been talking about, namely that these new philanthropists used to business model where you've got clear-cut outcomes. Gates can do the medical field. It's pretty clear. It's pretty clear outcomes that can be measured. But in so much, what foundations do is messy social stuff. And I'll never forget having lunch with Daniel Patrick Moynihan after the Ford Foundation's fiasco in Ocean Hill, Brownsville. And he said, uh, you know, what you foundation types ought to do is just stick to the opera. Something you know about. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good well, idea. <laughs> I think that that is my concern about a lot of the new philanthropy that there will be a lot of discouragement. If they're dealing with big, messy social issues, which are very difficult to get uh, to get at. Um, and I think one of the possible pitfalls, and I'll step on toes here, I'm afraid, uh, is too much reliance on the social sciences for uh, research in these messy areas. The validity of that research is a big question mark. That's I don't see any toes that you're stepping on right here. I mean, oh, you know, okay. our social scientists aren't doing that kind of stuff. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not around the table in any event. <laughs> I think that's one of the one of the issues that I'd be interested in what you have, have thought about, but the reliance of foundations upon social science research, which many areas of the univer modern universities uh, don't carry much weight. My I mean, one point is, I mean, are there organizations that can help to bridge this world between business and sort of the, the foundation or the philanthropic world? And what this brings to mind, especially on the business side, is uh, the World Bank's International Finance Corporation. I mean, that is bringing together bankable deals but looking for developed impact. And within that organisation, there is a, a very big debate between the, the, some of the development sandal wearers uh, and some of the hard-nosed business people. And they've actually been doing it for a long time. And I wonder if there's something that should be learned there. Um, and I think one of the risks with some of the new philanthropists, especially some of the hedge fund guys, is this slight sense of being masters of the universe with nothing to learn from anyone. Uh, and that really is a risk. Um, when actually there's probably a lot of this thinking maybe out there, maybe able to help. Let me give one, one example of education, something I know a little about. There have been about 10, well, 10,000 research studies done on how you teach reading. We don't know how to teach reading. And if you're going to make every kid literate in the world, we still don't know how to do it. It's Not every kid learns the same way. It's a principle. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think 
Where I can see there being a very high return on investing in education is places like India, where the state system is just failing to manifest it to even the basics. And so, um, you know, you're seeing a lot of the, the new wealth in India going into backing educational initiatives. And it is very much at the level of we can at least get people up to a, most people up to a basic level of freedom and you know, financial uh, adding up and that kind of thing. Let me throw just one further suggestion. One of the things that I think might be done on the educational mm -hmm. side, um, this is the century of the brain. This is where the cutting edge of science is going to be the brain in this century. And I remember going to one of the first meetings of something called neuroscience, bringing together all of it. This was 30 years ago. Why did I go? Because I was interested in education. That was the beginning of the first talk about left brain, right brain, all that kind of thing. And I said, when, how long will it take before you tell us what really can work in education because you figured out how the brain works? And the answer, this was 25 years ago, the answer was 50 years. We've now gone 25 years. So we've got 25 years to go, but I'm absolutely convinced that brain research, neuroscience, within the next 25 years is going to be bring dramatic breakthrough in how you teach reading, for example. I mean, I'd like to see a lot more risk-taking, basic research in the field of education, education tied in with the medical field, and et cetera. Well, that seems to be where someone like Michael Milken did a very good job because you know, he did adopt a high-risk yeah. approach. I and mean, this is where the, I mean, a classic example of saying, well, I will, this area I'm going to make my own, I'm going to focus on that, I'm going to bring in a lot of people who think outside the box um, and try and you know, break out of the conventional wisdom. Mm -hmm. I guess the pri X Prize is supposed to have a similar yeah, I don't know what sense of... I mean, the idea is that by just setting a, a challenge that you will produce original thinking in a way that you aren't reliant on the conventional wisdom that comes out of maybe the, the, the traditional universities. What I'm getting at is you guys are such a big picture and so much knowledge. You could set forth challenges. I would hope you would. <coughs> Matt uh, right. did a paper, Matt Liberty did a paper last year in my class on prizes as an incentive for behavior. Oh, I'd love to, I've oh. got to write about this next week. <laughs> <laughs> Give me your paper, I'll uh, sitting right there. <laughs> that, okay, the, the, uh, uh, very, do you have anything particular you want to say about the, 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 the uh, potential for prizes? Um, the comp the, the, you did all some of the cost calculations, I remember, from the paper. The, I guess the, just the thing that comes to mind from hearing the discussion is, uh, I think in answer to one of the questions, you said that one of the potential measures, or one of the things that will motivate a decline in this potential fifth wave of flying three is this failure to measure this problem, that there's no profit as a lodestar. Um, and I think that one of the ways that these prizes get around that is by met, providing this very clear way, at least where it can apply, of whether the, the goal has been met. I mean, if, the, if it's written down on paper, you need to meet these criteria to get the prize, then at least if the criteria are relatively definite, it will be a yes or no. You either solved it or you didn't solve it. Well, they did uh, that with, the, and, and the first X Prize really was with respect to getting commercial space, space product travel, wasn't it? And so you had a dis discrete outcome that was specified. They won, the, they, they did it. And how much money did they spend, all the, con the contestants spend? Do you remember? That's a great question. I think that I think the winning contestants spent 10 times the amount of the prize, which is <laughs> not sustainable. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not the yeah. hope, I think, is that, to, that it would work when the winning contestant spends a tenth, not ten times. Um, but in some, it was, it was on a scale of about ten to, the, ten to about hundred. Well, I think Ben Branson, I mean, with his prize, I mean, I think he partly he's, he said with his Space X Prize that that was, it just provided a bit of a catalyst to, to essentially ego driven people who yeah. wanted to. Right. What is the X Prize? It's the, oh, there so might be one other person who doesn't know. Right. So, so there's a, know. there was a prize of ten million dollars that was offered for the first um, successful private space flight. Okay. And that was one. Uh, there was a competition held, I think, two summers ago. Oh, it was a one-time deal. One-off deal, and a particular 
firm from nowhere came up with a solution to this. And then and Branson is now investing in essentially an upgraded version of their technology to, to be his first commercial space flight offering in about five years' time. Right. So they're now doing a whole lot of other prizes in other areas. Oh, no. That's the, and the guy that had just taken over the presidency of that, of that XPRIZE Foundation was the former head of education at the Gates Foundation. Yes. We hope that he will do better there than he did at right. the Gates <laughs> 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 got fired. Yeah. Uh, Charlie. A couple of comments from a social scientist who thinks there's no such thing as too much social science. <laughs> well, you know, economists really aren't social scientists. You all are policy people. What are you talking about, Charlie? <laughs> So a couple of reflections. <laughs> These things didn't come up in your talks much. One is that if you look at uh, where American contributions have gone these last few years, you know, this late 60s and all that, a lot of, of money has gone to universities. Um, how do universities fit in this whole thing? So this is not Gates, but it's everybody. It's lots of people, a lot of money. Giving money to universities, Stanford, by the way, is really uh, Making, um, getting a good share of this. But that also the percentage has gone down. I looked at just this morning, looked at, compared to the 60 in 1996 and now the 60 in the most recent one. Uh, of course, the numbers are just fabulous and bigger. The number over 50 million has really gone up, but the proportion to universities has gone down, but still this big. So that's just an observation. Number one, number two, in the story, you don't say much about. Um, government, especially don't say a lot about uh, tax policy. And tax policy, you might argue that both in uh, Britain and the U.S. has been important in, in, uh, in encouraging people to make donations, but more in, in the U.S. And the third thing is that all of this, uh, and by the way, I share my colleagues at uh, UBS and what you're saying. I think it, this, this is really, I, I, I think it will be very welcome. All this activity comes at a time when there's been increasing uh, dissolution with the government. The, uh, the, our leaders in this country have said to us as taxpayers, it's your money, it's not our money, it's your money. And so there's been attempts of fairly successful in scaling down what government can do. Now some people will point to New Orleans and say, this is what happens when you cut down government so much. But um, but anyway, it's, it's happening. Um, yesterday's newspaper had an op-ed by uh, Kristoff who contrasted um, Bush as president versus Carter as former president, what they're doing in Africa. I mean, it, it, it might be an example of what government is doing. But um, so in your, in your critique list. Was he positive about Bush in Africa? Excuse me? Was he positive about Bush in Africa or not? Uh, I think it was more of just uh, an absence of effect. Uh, but uh, he was positive about Carter. Uh, and we're talking about uh, you know, river blindness and, and his uh, ability to, uh, at 82 to still have some impact. But the, um, the other thing is on the critiques. One of the, the first one is Marxism. You know, you might make it a little bit broader. There was back in the 60s some populism. Um, that uh, in the U.S. that came out against um, foundations, but it's surprising how little you hear. It's, you know, the, uh, Americans are all believe they're going to win the lottery, so they're going to vote uh, to get rid of the estate tax, and, and it's sort of the same thing comes through here. Is that it's really surprising little little complaint about these massive uh, organizations that are throwing their weight around, but it, it, it all looks pretty benign. But uh, you know, there's so these are themes. I don't know where they come in your in your story, but I would think that they might come in there somewhere. There's a real difference, though, in the, in the culture of Europe uh, and the culture of the U.S. on this issue. I mean, you know, and you see it all the time. There was, it, it, I, I assume you've seen that book that was just published by Russell Sage. If you haven't, you should look at it. Um, uh, on I think the Ken Pruitt was one of the editors of it. Uh, which deals with the top, you know, the title of the book is the uh, foundation legitimacy, uh, and and but most of the art, I mean, the, every chapter in the book really is more European than, and there's one chapter really on the U.S. because there's not been a lot of, there's not very much literature in the U.S. Uh, scholarly or otherwise, 
uh, that suggests that there's every, there's, that's a serious question for the U.S. And it's, a, it's an interesting, it, it is to me an interesting difference in, in the cultures that you Although interestingly, I mean, you do in, in the U.S. you have a five percent payout rate for employment, which you don't have in that's correct in Europe, which um, you know I guess is why the legitimacy question might be more pressing. Well, also, I think that's right. Empirical literature shows that Europeans are a lot more upset about income inequality than Americans. That's correct. We're fine with. Yeah. But I think I mean I think that's <laughs> also well, you're speaking except for yourself, yeah. Right? You know, I think there's another, all your themes are very interesting. I, mean, I think the university question you know, is clear that. Um, you know, the rest of the world is looking at uh, America's universities and saying you know, philanthropy has completely changed the, um, the the global university marketplace, and it's created America's got all the winners. And ancient, great ancient universities like Oxford and Cambridge are desperately trying to figure out how to remain competitive against America, and that has. That, so that and that is, and they're all trying to look, find ways to imitate. Yeah, but in the next generation, we're going to be fighting the Chinese and the Indians, and as well right. as the Europeans. Yeah, right. but it's interesting that I think that we're going to use as a case study of how America's greater role of philanthropy and historically has um, you know, given it a real edge and is distorted and, and is leading the rest of the world to sort of ask we to, to actually like the idea of philanthropy and we say we need to get into this area. But and, it's sort and of you're now getting tax. Support for that. Some of these donors are looking at Stanford in a way that they that they would. Well, I don't want to set up my own foundation. So I'll just give it to Stanford and, and let them do it. In, in a way, universities are playing a bit of a role of institutionalized philanthropy. Yeah. Maybe it's because you, it, it takes less thought. Mm. But I think that's also why a lot of the newer philanthropists are now saying, well, actually, yeah, marginal added value by giving to a Stanford is, is pretty limited, and we'll leave that to the real estate guys because they don't really understand some of the more fascinating uh, capital, human capital questions of, of dealing with poverty and educational challenges in India or Africa, and we'll we'll go there. And so, I mean, the, the growing transparency of these other problems and the complexity of them may actually be more attractive to some of the people who see themselves as really kind of you know, nerdy uh, entrepreneurs who figured out something really complex. We're about to run out of time, uh, but if you, Joel, you have you have your hand up, your finger up. I assume that's yes. <laughs> um, I, I want to particularly talk to Mike, who I mean, the history lesson he gave us was was really an eye opener to us. We tend to think each generation does think that we invented it all, and it's really neat to see that, that, that it didn't. And the question I have is, um, what is driving this ebb and flow of philanthropy? We talked about things like the Black Death, but it seems to me a simpler way to do to characterize philanthropy occurs when there's excess money, it's a luxury good. And when there's, so then when there's war, you actually see very little about philanthropy. The whole nation is in a sense goose stepping together because they have to be. And so you can't, you, luxury, I mean, philanthropy is a luxury when we can explore different things, we, we can allow people to go their own way. And as soon as, um, say, if there's a huge oil crunch, a real one, or a huge energy crunch, you, you could expect that. Um, it becomes a, but, but it would need in your historical studies to sort of gauge the gross national, or the change in the in national product and philanthropy. And I suspect it'll, it'll come out pretty strongly. I mean, part we have philanthropy now because we don't know what else to do with it. So we're for a wash. I, suppose, I mean, the problem, of course, is data, you know, reliably. There's a big study of wealth in Britain by Arthur Rubinstein over the last 200 years. But what's interesting there is I think it doesn't, if you look at the super wealth there, it doesn't particularly correlate with philanthropy. Yeah? I mean, actually, what this tells actually is wealth in Britain is quite stable over time. But the, it doesn't explain why there are particular peaks at certain times. So certainly there must be an effect of there being a surplus. But I think it doesn't explain the whole phenomenon. Is, um, is the Britain, British case one of new money versus old? Is that, I mean, one would assume that that it's the new money that really doesn't know what to do with itself. I suppose and old money knows very reason. well what to do with it. So you have to take a group of wealthy. <laughs> That's why they're old. But. <laughs> then you, have to, you have to take a group of wealthy and you have to strip out old wealth. <laughs> yeah. See what right. new wealth there is and then see if that then correlates yeah. with the peaks. I mean, that's. Yeah. yeah. And there does seem to be this motivational thing that you know, if, if you made the money yourself, you feel much more inclined, much more you know, inclined to do what you want with it. And right. Whereas if you're you, and all you did was if you inherit it, you feel in some sense 
obligation. You cling on to it more and obligation not to. So I, I think, and clearly a lot of the new wealthy now, you talk to them wherever you go in the world and they, they've really looked at, you know, they, they've really embraced the idea that money can destroy your children and you need to, you need, but far better to give most of it away than to spoil, spoil them by giving it to them without strings attached. And that's even catching on in Europe now, which um, you know, didn't do historically. But the new wealth really has a greater cultural barrier to overcome in Europe than it does here, because the culture there has really been much more dynastic, much more a sense of the right thing to do is to pass the wealth on to your children in a way that hasn't, hasn't really been the case in this country to the, to the extent that it is in Europe. I was just stunned by the number of times people in Europe asked me you mean Americans give away a million dollars at a clip? I mean, much less a hundred million dollars at a clip at this point. He said, well, that would never happen here. I just had that conversation in vineyards, all of Bordeaux, which, where, where do I go? <laughs> and, and, they don't even they, give you a wine just, bottle. Just, maybe it's just the vineyard. But I think there was also the this period that the 20th century was a very, was a very strong, uh, exceptional period because of the two world wars and, uh, yeah, and what that sure. did. And uh, yeah, it basically discouraged anyone who had any money from doing anything that drew attention to it. And I think that now the rich are feeling more accepted as part of this sort of global elite and they're more comfortable uh, showing they have wealth and giving it away in, in, in visible ways. But you are seeing that across Europe starting to happen. Just to show you how I would date I am, I'm um, just one quick. 20 years ago, I, I had the idea, great idea, we were going to republish the gospel of wealth and I was going to put together a little group of very wealthy people to go around the country to try to cultivate their friends. Now look what's happened. <laughs> Everybody's reading the gospel of the world. Yeah. In any event, uh, I think this is great. I, we, I wish we could go on. Obviously, we could. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank uh, you. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you all. Let me remind you that the next uh, session of this seminar is a week from today. Uh, and we have uh, uh, Ed Skloot, the president of the Cerna Foundation, coming, uh, and um, uh, he will—he has a very interesting presentation. In, in some of the areas in which foundations have really made a difference, Ed, has, that he led that foundation into doing some of these things. It really, yes. a real sense of how to pick the right areas, be strategic about them, and do something about them. So thank you all very much, and thank you, Matthew and Michael, for coming. I know, but if I could, I promise you, were I to come in now, I have a little bit of a I have a little bit of a I want to tell us a little bit about the answer.